after uh, I was in New Hope for two years, you know, I saw there was there were limitations, so I moved to Philadelphia, and I had my gallery there for two years. But into the first year, I already knew that it wasn't the right place, that there were limits there as well. But what had happened, the thing that had changed was I had started, I, I started a website, and this was in 2001. And immediately people started to work, buy work from me online. So my business started to grow very quickly. And it was right around the same time that um, this you know, art movement called pop surrealism, that's one of the things that people call it, started to really catch fire. And I was one of a handful of galleries in the country that were specializing in it. Only at the time there was really just Rock LaRue, um, La Luz de Jesus, Copro Nason, um, Mary Karnowski. There might have been a couple other galleries, but they've since closed. So, and the, all those galleries were based on the, the West Coast. You know, I was the East Coast guy representing West Coast artists. So I was in Philadelphia for two years, but I already knew after my first year, I immediately started to look for a space here in the city. And then after two years, I closed up Tin Man Alley and I moved here to New York and I'm coming up on my 10th year next month. It has been quite a ride. Um, yeah, and it's interesting to look back on it and it's also, things change. And it's just life, you know? Yeah. And I think probably, yeah, you know, I've had a lot, a lot, a lot of fun. Um, and, you know, dealt with all sorts of change. And But ultimately, you know, I'm pretty grounded and I just go home to my little house in New Jersey. So, yeah. um, it's probably not as sexy as people think it is, you know? Yeah, I think, uh, I think there's pros and cons to it, as there always has been, and, you know, and sometimes it's really great that you're on the receiving end as a gallerist of an artist who's promoting their art really well, and it helps to sell the work, and helps promote the show, etc., etc., uh, but the, there's a variety of flip sides to it. The other flip side is, to it is that um, the market is oversaturated. I mean, we're oversaturated in every capacity. We're oversaturated with information. And the interesting thing that's happened is the market is sort of flattened out. There's sort of more of a hierarchy. And then um, there was all sorts of other people or you know, maybe you have a gallery in Mexico and a gallery in Japan and a gallery in Germany. But people didn't really know about it because they didn't really have access to it via the internet. Maybe they just came to New York and they were part of this hierarchy of you know, thousand galleries, the blue chip to the med mid level to the lower level galleries, and what the internet has essentially done is it's created this power for everyone, their own basic television station, in a way, in regards to their own having the internet, and it's basically flattened the market out. The market is much bigger and it's very flat, so it makes it more difficult to be seen, for artists to be seen, for the gallery to be seen. Um, the collectors have too many choices. Uh, you're competing for good press, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So it, it, while you can very easily you, it come out of complete anonym, anonymity, anonymity, am I saying that right? Yeah, yeah. Anonymity. <laughs> anonymity. <laughs> um, you know, and you could build your career pretty good if you're interesting. You're doing good work. It, it works in a lot of ways, and you get in in the sense that you know. We have access to collectors all over the world, so we have our own television station, basically, which is our website, that we're able to broadcast and have people come back to us. So that's great. You know, my business exists as a result of this, but it also has become more difficult. So, you know, I find it challenging. I find it very challenging. Again, it has its pros and cons. And the other thing is, because people are so oversaturated with information, the problem is they're always looking for the next thing. So you have an artist, people are interested in that artist for a few years, and then they're like, okay, we've absorbed that, spit them out, they're disposable, what's next? And, you know, as a gallerist, you're trying to be invested in an artist's long-term career, but if people are losing interest that quickly because they're ready to move on to the next thing, 
Um, it's not very easy for the artist or the gallerist to have any kind of stability. It's just more competitive. It's just much more competitive. Because, you know, your collectors also are buy from other galleries. So everyone's oversaturated, so ultimately it's... I mean, obviously we have very loyal clients because we're relatively successful, but it's still very competitive and you don't count on any of it. And you never know, industries change every six months now and it just moves, it moves so fast. And, and personally, I, I find that um, not the easiest thing in the world to deal with, you know, just in life in general. Things are just moving too fast, so... It has become very, very difficult to uh, choose the right artists because there's all these, there's, it used to be there was a handful of really good artists who did what it was that I was looking for. Now there's like a thousand of them. Not always just about, these are the secrets you're never supposed to tell, but it's not always just about the work. It's about, is that artist easy to work with? Does that artist manage your time well and, and, and meet their deadlines? Um, the other thing is because we're at a certain point, um, the galleries at a certain point, we don't typically take artists that are emerging. We typically work with artists who've already built a career. So there's a, a process of, um, we sort of have this vetting process at this stage because, you know, I could see a, a young artist and be like, that artist's work is really great. And then I look at another artist whose work I might not be as into, but they've been out there developing their career, developing their market. So I work with more mid-level artists, artists who've developed because we can't afford, we're a business, and we're a business that has a high overhead and 10 employees, and I'm showing them and, and taking the risk, but it's a, it's, you know, it's, it's a risky business. There's a variety of artists I've seen. There's a lot. Um, ones that have, I've noticed are Smith, Sonner, Sego. Um, there's an artist, Deer. I think his name is... Uh, you know, I noticed a couple years ago uh, some really great work coming out of Mexico, although I haven't really completely immersed myself in it. Every country has, is now having a group of street artists coming out of it. And maybe that, there's something about, like, Latin culture and, you know, bright colors and sunshine <laughs> that certain produces certain types of work. But the work that's coming out of Mexico seems really strong. Um, I think it's probably one of the more interesting street art scenes happening. So I think those artists seem to have a combination of being affected or being influenced by the culture as well as the global street art, you know, their own country and what's going on internationally. And obviously everyone's influenced nowadays by each other, no matter where you live in the world, because of the internet. So it seems to me that, it, you know, it's not a community of artists that's like in a bubble where they're unexposed. Now that's not the case. Mexican artists seem like they're probably more a part of, you know, the global dialogue going on between all these different street artists internationally. You know, I'm, opti I'm optimistic, but mostly I'm pessimistic because I've been doing this for so long and, you know, you'll see certain artists being shown in sort of mid-level import museums, people like Shepard Ferry, Os Jamios, Barry McGee, Fail, Swoon, JR. The art market has gotten so big and so competitive, and the street art market, the Pops Rose market, it's a parallel market. It's really big, but it's parallel to the more sort of elitist, intellectual, academic art world that's run by the museums and such, you know, so uh, maybe it'll happen, but I don't really see it happening anytime soon, to be honest with you, and I'm not sitting around holding my breath. Uh, Larry Gagosian isn't swooping up all these street artists. Um, none of the, you know, David Warner is not running in and swooping up all these street artists. None of the, the larger blue chip galleries are really, I can't even say the damn word, <laughs> championing. Um, this movement. I mean, Jeffrey Deitch was, he was the closest thing, and the artists he worked with were successful and are still continuously being successful. But I find that a lot of those artists that he worked with have really kind of separated themselves from this growing street art scene. Time will tell. Yeah. Well, I mean, that would be 
and it's been discussed and talked about a lot, would be the Banksy effect. You know, when Banksy, I don't know that it was specific to just him. Um, it wasn't specifically just because of him by any, any, any means. But he just was like, he was almost like Nirvana when like grunge kind of spilled over. It was kind of a catalyst and it's kind of came out of London, but it was his show in LA in, I believe it was the fall of 2006 that really changed everything in such a drastic way that we, it was moving so fast that we couldn't even comprehend what was happening. And that kind of spun out of control with artists' prices getting really inflated and collectors getting crazy and buying stuff, buying work up so they could flip it, and then the market crashed. But at the same time, the street art community has continued just to get bigger and bigger and bigger. So it hasn't really slowed down. For me as a gallerist, it's harder to be like, well, this is the artist I'm, this is the artist to work with. And you're like, which one? Because the crazy thing about visual arts is that you can have two artists and they both seemingly are very similar work or, you know, equally as good, but one takes off and the other one doesn't. And there's really no understanding why that is. Besides, you know, sometimes it's very much orchestrated, but, you know, most of the time you're like, why is this artist why are people responding to this artist much more than this one? They're both equally good. So when you've got so many to choose from, it's very hard to figure out, you know, who to work with. Um, I think Pose from Chicago is like, work. his work is really strong. And I'm really excited about this artist I have in my gallery right now. His name's Taku Obata. But I sort of just found him with his work on the internet. I really hadn't really hadn't shown that much and uh, I think that works just really amazing and inspiring. Um, I'm excited to see what Sonner does, you know, I think he's emerging and the way I, I track them, I watch. The artists that are kind of out there painting the most, getting the most press, I mean, you know, that you know, it's like these are the artists, Night Shows or Adam Crew or uh, the work of M City is really interesting. But those artists, I think, that I've mentioned all have very, the one thing I'm always looking for is somebody who has a distinct, distinct and unique voice. If you're looking for a distinct and unique voice. And because I look at so much work and I have a relatively good knowledge of, you know, visual culture, you know, you kind of can see what's really unique or what's, even if it's not, and people might still think it's derivative, it may have some kind of um, unique, there's still a unique voice in that, or a unique soul, or a different sort of take on something that's been done before. You know, the most fearless thing I can remember doing in my life, and it may not sound very fearless to people, but if, if I think about the most fearless thing I ever did, was when I was 19 years old, I got accepted to college in Ashland, Oregon. And it's kind of in the middle of nowhere. It's actually a lot like New Hope. It's a sort of like hippie town, arts town. 15,000 people live there. And you're kind of out in the middle of nowhere. And it was 3,000 miles away from where I grew up in Trenton. I applied to college there. I got accepted. I never visited. I just packed my bags and I moved out there. And I lived there for two years. So for me at that point in my life, that was probably... Overall, even moving up here and opening this gallery on my own and all these sort of things, you know, opening businesses, buying houses, whatever, hasn't, was never as scary as that thing that I did in my life. For me, that was the most radical thing I could do at, at that age. So, you know, I think that sort of was like, oh, I can do this. I can, maybe it helped me be able to make yeah. more risky choices and just go for it and try new things, so. Or is it still the same? No. <laughs> well, my favorite punk rock band when I was younger was, I'm gonna give you two answers. My favorite punk rock band was this band, Seven Seconds, from Reno, Nevada, who I still listen to. But my second up there was Minor Threat, which is Ian McKay's band. So his band after that was Fugazi, which is still basically like, whether you call it, consider it punk rock, probably what, it's one of my all-time favorite bands, and I still listen to them. 
look at my business often as a spiritual pursuit, which some people would think that sounds kind of strange. But ultimately, I'm interested in um, leaving behind a legacy where I was able to do something culturally, culturally significant that affected people in a positive way um, that maybe was innovative and made people look at things differently. I'm trying to help other people. I'm trying to do something um, like I'm involved in something that's much bigger than I am. And hopefully, you know, it has rippling effects that affects people in a lot of different positive ways. So, um, you know, that's that's my goal. Well, thank you so much, Jonathan, for this time. You're welcome. <laughs> you got See it. you in Mexico soon. Okay.